It's a sampler. It's a pretty wicked drum machine. It's an idea sketcher. It's fucking fun. It's an effects unit. Run your instruments through it. They will sound great. You've got pretty solid MIDI compatibility with it. The sequencer is limited, but cool for its own thing. And it's a great giant fake calculator. The very first thing that I'll say is that there's a lot of information in this video, so there are timestamps linked in the description. It's all laid out there for you, if you would like to jump to anything specific. In case you've been living underneath a rock for the past about a week, I mean, let's be real, we kind of all live underneath a rock, this this whole, you know, synth Dallas community. But unless you've been living under a rock underneath the Dallas rock, then you've heard of the EP-133. Everyone has already made their first beats. There's already full-on reviews explaining how to use it. Let's figure out whether or not it's even worth it to purchase the EP-133, depending on the gear that you may have. And I'll be putting it up against other samplers in my collection, like the SP-404 Mark II, because a lot of you requested that. I'm also really familiar with this unit, so I think it's a fair comparison to make. The POKO, obviously this is like the next iteration of a POKO, KO2. While pocket operators will be mentioned throughout this video, I do admit that they are pretty much like in the shadows of the KO2 and a bunch of other samplers in my collection as well. These are the only ones that are out, but I will be bringing up other relevant samplers that I think pertain to this comparison. In terms of the price point of these three, the EP-133 sits right in the middle. And I think that each of these are priced appropriately. The question is, where does it win in this comparison? Where does it not win? And is it something that you could see yourself using considering all of the other solid units that are out these days? Also, if you'd like to do a deeper dive into samplers and comparing them all together, I've actually done another video specifically on that. It's a deep dive. It's important for me to mention that I bought this unit. It was not sent to me. So these are all of my opinions. I mean, this is a comparison video. This video is not sponsored by Teenage Engineering in any way. It is, however, sponsored by DistroKid. There are affiliate links in the description of this video. Please consider using those links. It helps me a ton. And also it doesn't cost you anything extra. Your support really helps. Thank you. First point that I'll bring up is the fun factor. I think that this is really important and it's absolutely undeniable with the EP-133. You could do a lot with it, but it's also like really simple and streamlined in terms of the workflow. It definitely has grown on me really fast, but the question is, for how long? There's plenty of other samplers that are way more complex than the EP-133, but I feel like you really have to work them in order to get anything worthwhile out of them. It really takes that extra effort and focus, whereas with this, much like other TE gear as well, especially the OP-1, it's, it's very spontaneous and kind of sketchy. Sketchy as in like a sketch pad. Everything kind of just flows naturally while still being precise enough to come up with something that's worthwhile listening to in any genre that you want. So here, let me just come up with something right away on layer A, tempo 135. Been obsessed with this tempo, let's go. Two, three, and one, two, three, and. So just like that, we have three different voices. I could all obviously turn off the recording and now I could sort of um, audition other parts. Cool, so I want that to be there. Hi-hat. Two, three. And there we have a full on groove. On layer B, I'll choose this sound key. So now I have a open keyboard. I'm just gonna enter something random in here. Two, three. Back to layer A, I'm gonna hit fader, choose effects. From here I could choose the effects that I want. I absolutely love this distortion and I can mix this in to each of these layers. So let's mix it into layer B as well. And from here, I could change the uh, texture of the drive, the distortion. And then within each of these layers, I could actually move them independently. So let's say I don't have anything entered into the next pattern, let's say on A. 
So if I want to just move A, I'm going to move it backwards. One. So now I have a different drum groove. Move it backwards again. And so this is the only layer that's moving. Everything else is staying the same. If I want to move more than one layer at once though, I could hit A, B, A, B, C, A, B, C, D, and move them all at the same time. Let's go all to three. And this is what pattern three sounds like right now. To me, this is like a continuation of the OP1 workflow in the sense that everything is divided into four tracks and you could affect those four tracks differently. Minus the tape reel, of course. Another comparison I'll make to the OP1 is that the EP133 is also kind of like more of a sketch machine as opposed to something that you use to start from A to B to like finish your beat or your product or whatever you want to call it. I think that this is sort of a thread that we're going to see throughout this video. Let's take a look at the learning curve and general workflow between the EP133 and other samplers in my collection. The POKO is the easiest unit to use and sample with in this collection. And the EP133 is pretty much right there with it in terms of ease of use for sampling, but on top of that, you could do a lot more with the EP133 than the POKO, obviously. With something like the SP404 Mark II, uploading your samples is also very easy. There's actually an app that allows you to do that. Drop your sample in, it'll auto detect the tempo so that any effects that you add within the SP404 will be synced up to that track. It's the afterwards that gets a little bit more difficult with the SP404. As I mentioned, these are pretty much the exact same size, but there's so many more functions in this unit. So as you can imagine, lots of like dual functions, menu diving, all these different button combos and like muscle memory things that you have to uh, learn before you could actually create anything cool with the unit, in my opinion. But there's just a lot more that you could do in the SP404 in comparison to the EP133. Resample with any of the SP404's multi-effects. There are dozens of them to choose from. You could completely change the sample that you upload. You could obviously do the same thing with something like the MPC-1 or even to a certain degree, the model samples. You could tamper maybe a little bit more um, with your samples. Keep in mind that the model samples is more or less the same price as the EP133 as well. With this, you just don't have that same capability. You're limited to a few parameters per sample. So I'll just, let's say this kick right here. There is, if I go to sound, I could change the amplitude, the pitch. So that's just like on the, the main page. Shift sound and I have a bunch of other parameters I could work with here. So send, I could trim my sample, envelope, timing, MIDI, which we're gonna look into later. There's also mute groups, which is awesome. You of course have mute groups on the SP404 Mark II as well as the MPC-1. And there's actually more mute groups to choose from on the SP404 Mark II. So you can get a little bit more intricate with that. Going back to uploading samples and sample memory, with the EP133, uploading samples is, is very easy. The only thing is that there's only 64 megabytes of memory in this thing, as opposed to 16 gigabytes on the SP404 Mark II. So this thing is just like a sampling beast. It's not comparable at all. The SP404 is just much more flexible as a sampler, especially in terms of like a performance. You're never gonna run out of space. And the memory limit of the EP133 sort of puts it in my opinion, in a different category. It's more of a one-shot machine as opposed to a full-on sampler. So a comparison I can make there is the TR-8S, which I would also consider to be a one-shot machine, also an amazing drum machine. Here's a video. Speaking of drum machine, this makes for a great drum machine. We're gonna look at that a little bit later as well. You can chop longer samples in the same sort of way with these two. On this pad here, I have a longer sample that I've recorded through the uh, audio input. This is a similar approach to using a sampling pocket operator or even the OP1, except it doesn't auto chop the sample for you. You have to do that yourself. So how do I do that? Shift chop. I'm prompted to play in the chops the way that I want. So let's, let's try that. So this is how I'm splitting it up. If I want to refine these samples, I could go into each of them and of course trim them. So sound. Uh, groups, we're gonna go over to timing, envelope, trim, there it is, and I could trim each of these individually. You could do exactly this with the SP404, but they take it a step further. There's actually some other like chopping options that you could choose from. You're not gonna hear this, but let's say I'm using this sample right here, shift, chop, and from there I have auto mark, so I could auto chop it into however many parts that I want. I could also assign to pad. And so this is another aspect where you could go deeper with the SP404 Mark II. In terms of overall learning curve, it doesn't really take long to learn how this thing works. It does its thing, it does it very well, it does it very fluidly. Although I'm sure I'm gonna discover other like parts about it or other ways of using it, it took me a few hours to grasp the majority of this thing's function. 
which is great, but it's also a clear indicator that it's got some limits. Whereas I'm still finding brand new ways of how to use the SP404 Mark II. There's just so much packed into this machine. It just keeps giving, they keep updating it, which is an absolute win. It's the same with the DigiTac, the MPC, even like the OctaTrack. There's just so much more to work with. The trade-off of that, of course, is that you have to spend so much more time and energy learning how to use them, which may actually take away from the musical aspect in the short term. This whole concept is definitely something that you should be asking yourself about, like where do you think you sit within this spectrum? In this sense, if you're familiar with pocket operators, the POKO is to the EP-133 what the EP-133 is to the SP-404 Mark II. Design, feel, and build quality. In my opinion, this is subjective, but I just think that all TE gear wins design like overall in the synth world. They are a design company after all. The amount of hype there is over this thing and over pretty much every single Teenage Engineering product that's released is in part, I would say mostly due to the design of their products. This thing sold out in no time. It also feels good, in my opinion. I like the feel of the buttons. I also like the fader, it's pretty smooth. I am someone who appreciates aesthetic and thinks that it's a really important part of gear, especially synth gear. The SP404, I kind of gave it a bit of a facelift to make it look a little bit cooler, but it just doesn't have the same sort of design inspiring effect as Teenage Engineering products. Subjective, I know, but that's my take. Now, build quality, might be the opposite story. I'm just gonna say it, if you're gonna travel with Teenage Engineering gear, make sure you bring a case. It's not the most durable gear. Just through my own experience and what I've read on the forums, there is a chance that TE gear won't always be reliable. It looks like the EP-133 may be in that category as well. There's already a YouTube video about how to fix the fader, which, which I guess it's a common enough problem that there needs to be a video about it. As for something like the SP-404 Mark II, the build quality is great. Same thing with other samplers. Obviously, Electron Gear is amazing. The DigiTac, the DigiTone, Electron Boxes. Although the cheaper Electron units do feel a little bit more plasticky, like the model cycles, model samples. So that's something else to consider as well. The EP-133 doesn't have like a sick sequencer in comparison to the competition. There is tons of pattern space. I think each of these layers has, let's check. Yeah, they have 99 slots uh, each one bar. That's obviously way more than what you need, but there's only 64 megabytes of space, so it's it's a bit contradictory. In the sequencer world, it's becoming almost like a standard to be able to zero in on a specific note and then change any parameter that's available on that note. This is not something that you could do with the EP-133, which definitely sets it a little bit behind some of the competition. We already looked at the parameters that we could tweak, but that's on a per track basis and not on a per step basis. In this way, it's really coming from that PO realm. I'll hit main and from this page, you can see where all of the parts are playing when. They're lighting up. Also to let you know, there are some convenient copy paste uh, undo shortcuts that you could find in the TE EP-133 manual, it's on the website. So that is all handy. You could also record quantized or unquantized if you'd like with the EP-133. In terms of other samplers or groove boxes, as I mentioned, Electron still is, they're the pioneers I would say for sequencing on boxes that could do a lot of other things on top of that. From what I've seen, Roland is not far behind. The SP-404 does have some precision in that sense. Another kind of weird workflow, which we sort of touched on at the beginning of the video with the sequencer, everything is layered. So you have to hit all four of these at the same time in order to jump to a different pattern altogether, as opposed to just having like one button that could do that. So with the SP404, there's a pattern sequencer right here and you could just choose, jump from one pattern to the next. Same with the MPC, same with the DigiTac, same with the OPZ, same with the pocket operator. So it's just kind of weird that they chose to have this sort of layered thing and just to add here, there is the possibility of switching scenes. So the way to do that is just hit main and then you could choose the scene that you want. So I'm currently on scene one, let's say. Play that, it's probably gonna be quite random at this point. Yes. And we'll go to scene two. And it's something different. The thing with the whole scene thing is that this brings up a whole new set of limits. Well, I noticed that there are 99 pattern slots Per layer, it doesn't seem like you could have different samples per slot in each pattern. I'll show you what I mean here. So I'm currently on A2, just gonna play that. There is a kick playing right here. So that's the kick, right? I'm gonna go over to A3. It's the same kick. I'm gonna change that kick. Make sure I'm on the right sound, sound. I'm gonna change it to whatever, two. So now it's a, different, a completely different kick. 
back to main. Right, so now that's a different kick on this pattern. If I go back to A2, which is where I just was, it's that same kick again. So whatever sample you choose per slot within your patterns, it's gonna carry over into your next pattern. The whole 64 megabytes of memory is starting to make more sense. There isn't any sort of song mode to begin with, but this limit eliminates any sort of workaround to make that happen. Another kind of weird thing about the scenes is that none of them are empty. So let's say uh, I'm currently on scene two. This is the pattern. If I go over to scene eight, let's say, which is the last scene, I have not touched the scene yet. Uh, within the unit and hit play and it's the same pattern so it like auto copies over to the next scene it just assumes that you want to copy that current scene over which definitely caught me off guard another similarity with pocket operators is the punch in effect so if you just play a groove you can punch in these effects this works the exact same way as the pocket operator except it's touch sensitive. So if I wanna go a little bit harder, I push harder on that effects on that button. As always, I find that Teenage Engineering has such an interesting approach. I could see that they've pulled from different elements of other units that they've released and included them in the EP-133. And they're known for just like making statements. Like a great example of that is the OB-4, which is a speaker. It's also kind of a sampler. It doesn't have uh, audio output. You just have to listen through the speakers, which is an, a very interesting choice. I think the statement that they're making here is this separation of layers. So it's, as I mentioned, it's kind of like the OP-1 with the four tracks uh, on the tape reel. And this sort of limit will surely change the way that people use the instrument. Do I see this as more of a composition unit or a live unit? Especially in comparison to everything else, mainly the SP404 Mark II. On the 404 Mark II, you've got a pattern sequencer, you've got a mute and unmute mode, which is great for live. You've got dozens of effects to choose from and you can route those effects to specific buses, which are routed to specific pads if you'd like. So for example, you could split up your drums as well as your melodic parts and affect those differently. There's two master effects buses on top of that, all of which, all those buses you could route to an external MIDI controller so you don't have to menu dive. Like there's, <laughs> there's also a DJ mode, which is a whole other thing. I saw a video claiming that the EP-133 might be like an SP-404 Mark II killer. It's not, it's a completely different thing. And if you'd like a mind blowing video on what the SP404 Mark II is capable of, here it is. The EP133 doesn't even come close to what I just mentioned. There isn't any sort of individual pad mute mode, way less sampling memory. There isn't like a clear pattern sequencer, as I mentioned, like on the SP404, you don't really have that here. For any sort of live muting thing, I do find that it's a bit awkward with the fader and having to press down on whatever you want to mute. So for example, Let's say you just want to mute this track. There goes the kick. What if you wanted to mute this one? Same thing. What if you wanted to mute both of them? You hold down on both of them. So maybe that's fine, but if you have to mute all four, I just find that it's a little bit awkward as opposed to just having to press buttons. But the EP-133 sounds really good as an effects unit. Let's say I have an external groove from something like the Digitax. Here's what that sounds like. I could control my level right here. Let's keep it moderate. And then on effects, I have distortion. So I'm gonna go back to main. And this is my effects end for external audio. Ooh, sounds great. If I wanna go back to effects, I could still tweak like the, the color of the distortion or the drive. Right, so there's that. Let's try a different effect. Let's try Maybe a bit of reverb. A little bit shorter. Let's go back to main and put a little bit of that. So that's a different color. Let's try, I think chorus is pretty good too. Let's try that chorus. Where is it? There it is. Ooh. A little bit more modulation. Back to main, let's put a lot of this on here. Maybe get a little bit more volume. Yeah. So yes, the EP-133 does work as an effects unit as well. And this is a weird comparison I'm about to make to the Lyra 8. 
I know it's weird. The Lyra 8 is great for like luscious wall of sound types of pads, but I'm using it predominantly now as an effects unit for its distortion as well as its delay because it sounds so unique. And these effects do sound pretty good, so I could see myself using them later on. Maybe if I get bored of the sequencer. What I'll do, I'll go to layer B, layer C, I'm gonna lower all of these. So now you're just hearing layer A. So the, this is the, the lower end drums. Then I got my mid drums here. So just a snare, C. Just mix those in. And then D, which is kind of hard to hear, but it's like these, these pitter patter things that are happening like in the high, high end. In fact, let me bring these back down so you can really hear the pitter patter. So how did I, how did I get that effect? So I went to fader release. So that's what the, those two samples sound like. But if I really pull down that release, it becomes like this sort of like tip top sort of thing that I really like. Uh, I find that that's a really interesting effects for drums. And of course, to make like a stereo image sort of thing, you could pan these. So shift sound, send. I'm gonna make sure I'm on this sound here. And I'm pretty sure I already have it panned on send. So this one is, let's say far, far uh, left. And this one I'll go on the right. Going back to my effects, I'm gonna go back to distortion because I find it sounds so good on drums. And take note that this is a master effect, so you can't choose different effects for each layer. It affects all of them at the same time, depending on how much you send to them. So let's go to layer one, fader, make sure that it's on effects, and we'll give that low end. Oh, damn. Change that color, maybe less, a little bit less drive. That's so good though. B, uh, sorry. Okay, so yeah, sorry, I just unmuted it. Effects, pretty cool. Already like the, like the noise that it's adding, I love that. MIDI compatibility. This is a big one for a lot of people. How is this compatible with other gear or software? There's already some videos out there showing that you're able to control the EP133 with a MIDI keyboard if you'd like. So for example, instead of using the keys, you could connect a controller, a MIDI keyboard and play on that instead. That way it's a lot easier to enter in your ideas. The question is, how is the MIDI sync on this thing? I'm using the Digitone to sync up to the EP133. Seems to work fine. But the question you should be asking in this case is, would you really even want to be using the EP133 as a brain? There are much more powerful sequencers out there. Even just like the model samples, which is very similar to the EP133, has a much stronger sequencer. And of course you could step it up from there if you wanna use something like the Digitact. Even the Circuit Rhythm or the SP404 Mark II, which would certainly make for a more efficient brain than the EP133. As we already went over, the sequencers are much clearer and stronger. That being said, if this is your first instrument with the sequencer, then I think it does make for a good intro into the sequencer world. I'm gonna show you something else that's kind of cool though. I'm going to hit play, find my melodic instrument in this particular groove. This is it right here. Uh, shift sound MIDI. From there, if I turn the orange knob, I've chosen channel one. And if I go MIDI out into MIDI in of my diggy tone, let's hit play on this, let's see what happens. And there you go. So that melody has been doubled here and is now playing on the Digitone. If I want to change that voice, let's say. Is it gonna change, hello? There we go. So yeah, you could do this on every slot here. You could change each of these to a different MIDI channel and then control those, let's say, on the Digitone. And if you mute this channel, so now we're hearing it with uh, this melody here on the EP133. Now it's just the uh, Digitone. So what you could do if you wanted to is mute, let's say, layer B and use that just for controlling other instruments. Should I explore that in a future video? Let me know in the comments. Doing this sort of thing with other samplers, the first thing that comes to mind, of course, is the DigiTac where you have eight MIDI voices. You could do this exact thing. Plus, it's like a million times stronger of a sequencer. It's also like three times the price. Audio exporting options, this is sort of like a question mark at this point. There's nothing about this in the manual, so I'm assuming that what you see is what you get. You could either export as a master track or you could maybe mute each of these layers and then export separately that way. 
I've read the forums as well. There's no information about this. If anyone knows anything, I'll make sure to pin that at the top of the comment section so you could see it. The next topic I think is a pretty important one. Is this thing a grower or a shower? <laughs> is it just like a quick hype sort of instrument? Before getting into that though, let's talk about today's sponsor, DistroKid. There is a discount linked in the description of this video, which I encourage you to use. It's just over $20 a year to release unlimited music to all major streaming platforms. The thing that makes DistroKid amazing for independent artists is just the sheer amount of free promotional tools that they offer us. There is now a DistroKid iOS app so you can check out your stats and information on your smartphone. Personally, one of my favorite free promotional tools is HyperFollow, which is essentially a free link and bio link. I've been using it for years now to lead people to specific pages and help fund what it is that I do. And you could claim as many HyperFollow pages as you'd like free of charge. Just over $20 a year to release unlimited music, you keep 100% of your streaming earnings as well, which is another great deal. If you're an independent artist, to me, it's just a no brainer. Join the team. There's over 1 million users using DistroKid. So yeah, join us. I don't have like a definite answer, but I'm pretty sure I'm gonna be using this for a while. At this point for me, in terms of electronic music hardware, it either becomes like a composition tool to make samples with. And then if the samples sound good enough, drop those into Ableton Live and perform those in a live setting. Or it becomes a tool in combination with Ableton Live in a live setting. So something that would help me control Ableton or complement it in some way, maybe take some weight off of it. I certainly do not see myself using this in a live setting as a live performance tool, but I'm already loving it as a composition tool, especially for drums, as you heard. The thing for me that's gonna bring variety to this instrument is using different samples with it and not necessarily the workflow itself. In terms of Teenage Engineering gear in general, and just like the impact that it's had on this channel, the OP1 and OPZ are what spawned pretty much everything. That being said, I haven't really seen myself gravitating towards Teenage Engineering gear recently. I've sort of graduated to higher quality things, I would say, until now. I feel like the EP133 and I guess the EP series, they're definitely gonna come out with a few other models as well. That's what's pulling me back in. In any case, I think that the hype surrounding the EP133 sort of confirms all of my thoughts and feelings about it. But of course, everyone's got their opinion and only time will tell how people are gonna react to this thing in the long term. Where do you guys stand? Let us all know in the comments. This is my impression, my deep dive impression of the EP133. Hopefully it's pointed you in the right direction. If it has helped, please do consider using the affiliate links in the description of this video. I would make a small commission off of your sale. It doesn't cost you anything extra though. So that's the best way of supporting like and subscribe any comments let me know in the comment section and yeah hope to see you soon